We're going to turn to the Word of God and uh, just continue our theme tonight. And uh, it's part five. It's part five in the wilderness. Right, let me share with you that we often make the journey to Canaan more difficult for ourselves than what it is supposed to be. I see that in the lives of the Israelites, but I also see that in our lives, in my life, and in some of our lives as well. We make this journey to the promised land. Maybe it is a, uh, whatever the promise for you might be tonight, as we make it more difficult than it's supposed to be because we sometimes go into sin like the Israelites did, or just unbelief. So I want to encourage you today. You are on a road to Canaan. God has got a destiny and a plan for your life and my life as well. And when we go through the valleys, remember it is there where God is teaching us to be faithful. It's there where God is teaching us the lessons of life. And then sometimes we experience these mountaintops where we experience the glory of God. But we can't stay there. We can't remain there. And tonight I want to say to you, if you're in a valley or you're busy climbing the mountain. And if you're not on the mountaintop, don't be discouraged. Don't be disheartened because you can't stay on the mountain. A lot of what we live and how we live as believers is lived down in the valley or climbing these mountains and our spiritual muscles are being developed. What do you think of when I use the word desert or wilderness when it comes to the Israelites? What did it look like? You know, when I think of the word uh, desert or a wilderness, I think of thick sand and definitely no water. But I listened to a video the other day of Jonathan Lipnick, a professor of Israel Institute of Biblical Studies, and he gave me some interesting insights in this Israel's wilderness experience. Now, he shared this, and I want to I just share what he shared. The Hebrew word for desert is midbar, and it comes from the verb called lehatbir which means to shepherd one's flock. Now I want you to to see what I'm saying here tonight. Here we are and we think of a desert of thick sand and no water and, and what it really means is a place where a shepherd is shepherding his flock. So this means that a shepherd would take his sheep and his goats out of the rural area and would take them into the countryside to feed them. He is not taking them into a desert with no food, total barrenness, a wasteland, sand dunes, dunes and nothing else. That would be unreasonable. And so also you must remember that the Israelites probably traveled with goats and sheep and and some other animals as well. And why would God lead them into a place where there was absolutely nothing to feed their animals if he knew that it would take them a while to get to the promised land? So the desert, Midbar, is an unsettled area with sparse but sufficient vegetation to support a flock of sheep. And that is exactly what God did when he took them into the desert of Sinai. It is in this area where God wanted them to readjust from what they were used to in Egypt. He wanted them to readjust and to refocus. It was in the desert where he wanted them to prepare themselves for the promised land. Prepare themselves to enter into the promised land. You see... The desert was a place where God wanted them to neutralize themselves from what they'd learned from the influences of Egypt, the outside influences. It was not, I don't want anyone to say probably, it was not God's original plan for them to remain in the desert, to spend 40 years there. It was his plan to go through this desert experience. It could have taken them a little while to get to Canaan, but definitely his plan was to re-educate themselves and then enter as a nation with all the religious structures in place into a promised land that God had prepared for them. You know, when the Bible speaks about God, it often speaks about God as a shepherd. In Psalm 23 verse one, it says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The Lord is my shepherd. 
When I go through those valleys, the Lord is my shepherd. John 10, verse 10 to 11. Verse 10 is probably the most favorite, one of my most favorite verses in the Bible. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And then he comes in verse 12 and he says this, or verse 11. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. We continue to learn some lessons from this desert experience. We continue to, to, to see what God said and what God did for his people and what you and I can draw out of this. And tonight I want to mention a couple of points, so please write them down. Uh, they will be on the screen or otherwise on our website as well. You see, my dear friend, there is not a day in our lives where we don't need the grace of God. Not one day when you can get up and say to yourself, I don't need the grace of God. So every day we should get up and say to the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, will you strengthen me? Will you fill me? Will you demonstrate the amazing grace of God? Because without the grace of God in my everyday life, I will not live this life to my full potential. You see, it is the grace of God that keeps us focused. It is the grace of God that gives us the ability to run, run this race and run through these valleys and run through these wilderness and not allow it to drain us. So if you drain tonight, you know what to do is rely on the Holy Spirit and ask Him for His grace. You see, while they were in this wilderness experience, time after time, God performed miracles to sustain them, to encourage them through this experience. Their journey from Egypt to Canaan wasn't going to be 40 years. It wasn't going to be, it wasn't meant to be such a long journey. You see, a footman, as I've said before, would be able to walk this distance in about 10 days, 40 kilometers a day. But obviously there were children and livestock involved. And so, but definitely not 40 years to cross the distance of 250 miles or about 400 kilometers. That was not God's intention. And here they are in the desert. They are wandering. For 40 years they're wandering towards the promised land that God has given to them. What was supposed to be a short journey became a long journey with lots of pain and also lots of test. It must have been intense, wasn't it? It must have been a tough time in this wilderness experience. And surely they did get weary while they were going through it. But God met them every day where they were. And they learned through the years how to rely on Him. They've learned that every grueling step that they took in this wilderness experience, that God was reliable, trustworthy, and that they could put their faith in Him. You see, we see it over and over in God's Word. Stories of how God never leaves us, never wants us to fend for ourselves when we go through difficult times. He is always there. And the fact is this, is that if you and I would look up to God, we will find that He is present in the most difficult experiences that we go through. God is present. He is right there for you and me. Let me mention a couple of things I think that is important to us. The first thing is that the way to the promised land or the way to victory is not always easy. It is not always easy. Isn't it true that some of the things that you enjoy most maybe uh, after a while is, is the stuff that you worked for the hardest? Isn't, uh, don't you value them and look after them a lot? And you've learned that your, your, your way to success, your way to victory, your way to the promised land wasn't always easy. You see in Exodus chapter 13, God said, let my people go. They were let go. He let them, uh, uh, and, and it, didn't make com it didn't make sense the way he led them even. You see, because um, my view is that, that I would have taken the people the shortest way to the promised land. But God had a different view because he understood that on the short distance to Canaan would be a severe enemy called the Philistines. So in uh, Exodus chapter 13, verse 17, he says this, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So what he did is he led them a roundabout way towards the promised land. But in this roundabout way, they come to what is called the Red Sea. Now I can, I can just hear the Israelites in my, in my mind here grumbling and saying to themselves, can you see the water? 
Can you see what we're approaching? How on earth? We don't have boats. There's no bridge here. How are we going to cross this sea? And the fear is just rising in them. And this was just the beginning of the journey. See, God had promised His people that He would lead them to a land of blessing. It was worth fighting for. It was worth going the dis distance. You see, this difficult or desert experience would stretch their faith, my friends. It would test their faith. It would test their ability to trust God and to depend on God like nothing or no one before. We often face journeys in our lives. And you might be thinking you're on the way to a promised land. And maybe you're going through this test and you feel like the blessing is too far ahead of you. It's too long to wait for. Or maybe you feel like giving up because it seems to take too long for God to actually say, uh, uh, do what he said he would do. I want to encourage you today, my dear friend, the shortest distance to Canaan is not always the best way to get there. And if you're going through this journey, God may be testing your faith. You may be, have to prove to God and yourself that your trust is really in Him, that your faith is really in Him. There are a number of ways that my faith has been tested in this last few days, last few weeks, and I'm sure yours as well. So the, the way to the promised land is not always easy. The second thing I think that is important is that God will make a way where there seems to be no way. Oh, we love that song, don't we say it's an oldie. It's God will make a way where there seems to be no way. And so on, and we sing it. But when it comes to the actual test, it is something very different. Do we believe, really believe, that God will make a way through our wilderness experiences? Exodus chapter 13 verse 18 says, So God led the people around by the desert towards the Red Sea. Towards the Red Sea. Towards the obstacle. Now listen, it is evident that God knew exactly what was, was going to happen at the Red Sea. It is evident that God knew exactly where He was taking His people towards. And here they are approaching the Red Sea. And I am sure that Moses was the first one. He probably led from the front. Moses was the first one to look at the Red Sea and probably think by himself or maybe shared it with his wife and see, can you see the water? Maybe the surprise was rising up because they were following the leading of God. Yeah, the surprise and maybe even misbelief in his own heart. But definitely that's how the people felt. And the result is they started to murmur. As they got closer to the sea, what did they do? My dear friend, they looked at the obstacle in front of them instead of the God who is most powerful to take them through it. You see, their eyes were fixed on the problem and not on the bigness of God. But God did not forget them. And the word is on, and we've gone there, there already. He split the sea, and the enemies were drowned. And this, this absolute miracle became a testimony towards Israel and their descendants. Still today, they remember this mighty act of God. You see, here's the phenomenal thing that I want you to hear tonight. God led them to the Red Sea. God led them to this obstacle straight ahead. But the same God who led them to the obstacle also led them through the biggest obstacle they had faced by then. And this was only the beginning of their journey. Even if the way of faith, if the way that God is leading you does not make sense, even if you think the timing is off, even if you think the wait is too long, even if the wandering in the desert thing is, is testing you so much, let me tell you, you can and should trust in Him always. He knows your way. He knows my way. He sees the big picture. He has good in store. And though it may not be what you thought it would be, may not, may not be the route for your own life that you would have chosen or the things that you would like to have accomplished, but in His sovereignty, God takes care of you by His powerful leadership. God is always there. God is with you. And His ways are the right ones. You see, the next thing I think that is important for us to understand is that God will lead us day and night. God will lead us day and night. It said in Exodus chapter 13, verse 21, by the day, 
the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them and in, on their way. And by night, a pillar of fire to give them light. God never left, left his people alone on this journey, my friends. His presence was always with them. Wherever they went, he reminded them through the cloud and through the pillar of fire that he was not leaving them. He would lead them day and night, shade and with this pillar of fire. God will not leave you and me to fend for ourselves in difficult times. He will not leave us to struggle on our own and to just find our way in the dark. He will lead you. His promise is that he will be faithful. You may not see a cloud in the day or a pillar of smoke or fire at night, but let me tell you, you may not have the same experience or I that the Israelites had uh, visibly, but we have his word and we have his spirit and to guide us through our difficult days. God's promise to you like it was for the Israelites is that he will not leave you alone in the battles that you will face. He goes ahead of us. He walks beside us. He is our rear guard. The truth is you will never have to walk through these difficult things on your own. Another wonderful thing if I look at this experience in the desert is that God fights on behalf of his people. It said in Exodus chapter 14, verse 19, and you've got to read Exodus, the whole book of Exodus, and see how God led them and how the powerful things God did. In Exodus 14, 19, it says, Then the angel of the Lord withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them. That indicates the protection of God around his people. When Israel faced attacks from their enemies, God was with them. God was faithful to deliver them. He works in miraculous ways in the toughest battles that you and I can go through. Nothing is too hard for God. Nothing is too hard for Him not to take us through it. He gives us victory and power even when it does not make sense. Let me tell you today, my friend, it is as true as it can be. His angels and God himself is fighting for you. It is he through his angels and he himself that is guarding us. This is how he loves us. He is des his desire to protect us, to hem us in from all sides, to keep us under his care. It does not mean, though, that you will not go through hard times. It does not mean you will not face battles. That's not what I'm saying. But it means in the midst of those in the midst of your testings and your wilderness experience listen to what God is saying in Exodus chapter 14 verse 14 it says the Lord will fight for you you need to only be still that's a difficult part isn't it it says God will fight for you all you got to do is to be still you see it's only when we still that we hear his voice that we listen to him speak we are never left on our own to wrestle through these things, these hard places in our lives. He doesn't send us out to fight our enemy in our own strength. All he says is be still, be still. Know that I am fighting on your behalf. Oh, another wonderful thing from this book of Exodus and this journey through uh, the desert is that God provides in miraculous ways. God has provided in miraculous ways. In Exodus chapter 16, verse 4, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread. I will rain down bread from heaven for you. He made a promise of quails as well. And then later in Exodus chapter 17, when they were thirsty, it says, Strike the rock. And water will come out of it for the people to drink. They were hungry, God fed them. They were thirsty, God gave them something to drink. God refreshed them by what he offered to them. Manna and water every morning in the wilderness experience. So it is with us too. You see, they, they were not allowed to store up food, which means daily they had to trust God. And maybe your storeroom is empty, but I'm telling you, daily you will trust God and you will come through this because God promises his provision each morning, every day, as you wait for him, he will meet your needs. The people of Israel were satisfied in the desert. They were nourished in the desert. They were cared for in the desert. They never lacked. God's resources, my friends, never run dry. Sometimes 
we miss the miracles that God wants to show us. Sometimes God does the miracles and we don't see it even because of our busyness and our stress. But even for those days, there is grace. He waits for us. His provision and His blessing will never run dry for any one of us. The sad thing, though, is when I look at these Israelites and just saw the provision of God in such wonderful and powerful ways, is the same people sin so often against God. Let me tell you, my friend, sin will always take us along a much more difficult road to our destiny. Sin will always take us through a much more difficult road to our destiny. You see what God says to Moses about these people in Exodus chapter 32 verse 9. He says, I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are stiff-necked. That's what I see. They were grumbling and complaining. And let me tell you, this kind of sin, grumbling and complaining, leads our hearts away from God. And these things were far too common in the Israelites, but it's also true in our desert wanderings. Is that It's often like this, where we stray, we lose sight of what God did yesterday, and today we complain because it's not doing the same today. You see, we lose sight of how He carried us in the past. And as we sin against Him and start grumbling and let our hearts be turned away from God, we go down roads that we wished we would never go. That's what happens. God had great mercy over them in those days. They tested him. And, I, and even then, God graciously provided for them. My friends, in my own life, I've also seen the same. I'm sure you can echo this, that in times of, of, of where, where I've maybe grown cold or maybe not done exactly what God wanted me to do, God's grace and God's protection has been over me. In Exodus chapter 32, and I'll come to that another time, we see how quickly they turned away and worshiped God and the next day worshiped a calf made out of gold, handmade, bowing down to a false god and an idol. How easy is it for us to forget the blessings of God? You know, I've heard people say to me in those last couple of weeks, y'all yeah, got this and got that and point finger to God. And the same people just a couple of months ago shared how God blessed them and how grateful they are. And now in the time of testing, they're pointing finger to God. How quickly do we forget the provision and blessing of God? We start complaining. We grumble. Our hearts go astray. It then leads into a deeper path that we wished we had never entered. And there's often deep regret. You see, sin gets hold of our minds and of our hearts. It's like a disease that we can't shake off in our own strength. But God in His mercy will forgive and set us free. And I encourage you to find fresh purpose and hope in God. One more thing that is so important, or maybe two, is that we may have forgotten or we may feel that God has forgotten us, that God, the fact is He is always with us. He is always with us. In Exodus 33 verse 14, hear these words. The Lord replied, and you must remember these words were written after God just said the chapter before, these are stiff-necked people. The same God now says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. My friends, God has not left you on your own. He is always with you. The presence of God is powerful and strong. We may not always be aware of it. We may not always see it, but sometimes we'll only look back and then we will remind ourselves how faithful God had been during our struggles. It wasn't God's plan for 40 years in the desert. It's not God's plan for you and me to go around and around the mountain as well. God is always at work, maybe not in your timetable or at mine, but He is at work. You see, the hardest struggle we face, friends, have the greatest potential to teach us the greatest lessons. Let me say that again. I really want you to get this. The hardest struggle that you and I face have the greatest potential to teach us the greatest lessons. It is true, not only for the Israelites, it is true for you and me as well. We often face these battles and struggles like we're going through now with COVID-19 and, and other stuff that is going with it, losing of jobs and all kinds of stuff and worrying about finances. In this battle, we can see 
We, God, the, there is the greatest potential for us to learn the greatest lessons that God has for us. You see, we may feel forgotten, we may feel alone, and yet the hardest struggles and the, and the battles we go through, God can teach you the lessons of patience and endurance, of trust, of faith, of reliance on Him, and walking and finishing this race like nothing else can. The years of our own desert wanderings may prove to be our most power-packed, strengthening, faith-building time of our lives. But sometimes we only recognize that when we go and we look back, not when we are in it. Sometimes we find ourselves that we are forgotten and we need to listen again to the whispers of God. Where God says to you and me again tonight, my presence will go with you. I will give you rest. In whatever you face today, be assured God is with you. He will provide your needs. He will protect you. He has a plan. Nothing is too hard for him. He will give you rest. What have you got to do? Just be still. Just be still. That's what you've got to do. That's what I've got to do. God will fight our battles for us. He will never leave us. 